Listener Production. Hi, it's Rusty here. We're just about ready to launch into the final part of our feature episode with two-time Australian rally champion Rob Herridge. Like many in the rally family, the good ones can talk and talk well because we're not watching the clock and Rob's up for a chat. We have made this a rare three-parter. If somehow you've skipped parts one and two and landed here, you are missing some gold. Like his early life in country West Australia and how sporting parents helped harden his competitive mindset. Farm life also gave him hands-on engineering skills. He calls himself a pretengineer, but his craftsmanship is every bit as good I'd argue even better than many with a formal qualification. As is Rob's way, those solutions are often about practicality and functionality rather than chasing holy grail levels of horsepower and so on. You'll also hear about his barefoot water skiing talents, meeting and forming a friendship with another rally legend, Ross Duncan, and moving into the sport on a whim and thinking that he was world champion material on his first ever transport stage. That is a very funny yarn. We're in the control, last stage of this event. Clock's counting, so let's get into it. The final part of my pod with Rob Herridge. Enjoy. Let's talk Dean for a a little minute here, just in terms of his own career. I mean, were there moments where you were pulling your hair out around the Hyundai and he went off to England for a little bit and it was, I mean, again, it was a, um, a big commitment from a business perspective, he's your son, all yeah, those sort of absolutely. things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when when we sent, um, it was looking like because I was I had done some pace noting work for um, Colin McRae, mm-hmm. I'd become mates with Derek Ringer. So tell us, tell us about that. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I was because I'd won the championship for Subaru. I was uh, I was. Uh, as a bit of a, a token of appreciation, I let go to the um, the Rally of New Zealand, come along and do Possum's gravel notes. Great, involved with the Pro Drive team. So I arrived there. It was just a, not a very special car, but it's a Corona. I think it could even have rally tyres on it, but it's you know whatever. So I'm doing the. Um, I, I drive around the course and I make some notes and my job is to drive just before they close the stage and then... Uh, latest information on latest what information it's like. On, yeah, the, yeah. on the stage conditions. Mm. Not changing their pace note, but mm. mud, snow. And, and what am I looking for? Are we looking for ice, snow, mud, black ice? And I go, black ice? Well, what does that look That's like? That's a thing over there. Yeah, and I say, what does that look like? Well, you can't see it. And I say, how will you know when you you'll got feel it? Say, it. You'll know. <laughs> and of course they had all of that. So. Um, and of course, Colin was under some pressure to, to win because he hadn't won a rally yet. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, Pro Drive under some pressure because they wanted to debut the Impreza and the Japanese factory wouldn't let them debut it until the Legacy had won a rally. And they said the Legacy is too good a car not to have won a round of the World Rally the Championship. Championship. So you can't debut the... So they're all under pressure and the Japanese are there. So anyway, so Colin and Ari Vartan, Colin McRae and Ari Vartan are doing the rally and so is Possum. And uh, I don't think Possum's car was quite as good as theirs, but anyway, I'm doing the notes. And um, on the first night, um, the, the Dave Richards, the boss of ProDrive, Pro called yeah. me aside and I think, you know, I've been summoned by God here, you know. And he said, I hear you're doing gravel notes for Possum. And I'm going, well, yeah, I am. And he said, can you think you can do them for Colin? because we're a bit of pressure here. Colin's leading the rally and Ari's coming second. I've gone, well, yeah, um, bows. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll need his notes. And they say, yeah, well, we'll, um, we'll, we'll get, you've got to get them sorted tonight. I go, what? So, and as I'm walking out of the office, Ari Vartan grabs me, because he and I have already mm. been mates. And he says, Rob, I hear you are doing gravel notes for Colin. I said, yeah, apparently. And he said, you think you can do them for me? <laughs> no. Hey, yeah, okay, you get me. And as I get further out, Poss, Possum goes, Poss, uh, Rob, uh, apparently you're doing some other, you're still good with mine, aren't you? I go, hey, sure. sure. <laughs> Three lots of gravel notes. Three lots of gravel notes. All different. So I'm going, you know, I go up to um, Derek Ringer's room, Colin McRae's co-driver. co-driver yeah. Knock, knock, knock. Yes. I'm Rob Herridge, and 
I'm doing your gravel notes, so can, if I can have your notes, uh, I'll just take them away and photocopy him. He goes, I that don't, won't be I, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> and he goes, I said, yeah, yeah, um, your boss, um, what's his name? <laughs> he was going to square it away, he says, I'll make a call. And you can hear him saying, really, really? <sighs> Righto. He comes back, he gives me notes, says, do not lose them. Yeah. Don't worry about a thing. <laughs> Same thing with Ari's co-driver. So down to the dealership, we're at the dealership in the middle of the night, like um, Watergate. Off, using the phone like Watergate. Yeah. <laughs> to the light. <laughs> so on the... Um, like a spy movie. Next, the next day, there's the co-driver, safety first, in the Corona with the big board on his lap with three sets Some of pat- notes. The notes. And we ran on Colin's notes and he just ticked and made amendments to the other ones as we went. Unbelievable. And then we would try to call the amendments back through the helicopter and we very soon, Dave Richards gone, do not tie up this channel. Gotcha. So we had to then just go like 100 miles an hour back to the service, give Give them them the the notes, notes. and Colin was winning a rally and on a bit of a high, he would take, go what? Get the amended notes, throw them over his shoulder because he wasn't worrying about that shit, but his co-driver Derek would come around the back and pick them up. Gotcha. And that's how we became mates. Mates. but before we even got to that point, I'm going to do possum's notes. And possums, anyone who knew possum, had very complicated notes. He had twice as many pages as anyone else, at least. And they were very complex. And Dr. Roger Freeth was, you know, he, and I said, how can you get all this stuff out? And he said, Rob, if your life depends on it, you get it out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to photocopy them. And we're at the Suvery dealership. And he says, here's the notes, and these are the books, and there's like books on them. And he said, and he's in the next room touching them up like they do, putting sticker on things, just making them all neat and tidy. Yeah. And he says, well, he's got to photocopy them. So myself and my co-driver go into the next room and we're photocopying. He says, don't unspiral them. No, 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 we're fine. So we turn over one page and we put it on the machine and we press the button and dude. Okay, open the top, turn the, turn the page, dude. And I'm thinking, this is going to take, take forever. forever. <laughs> this is going to take forever. What we'll do is we'll unspiral them. Don't unspiral them. Yeah, no, we're right. We're good. We'll unspiral them. And we put one book in. We put the next book in. So about three books worth. All in there. And then we press the button. And as we press the button, off it goes. And I'm catching the paper. And they're feeding in. And there's about ten pages in there. And then all of a sudden, paper jam. With uh, the notes in there, the real notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, oh, that's not good. How are you going in there? You know, that one's spot. No, no, we're all good, Roger. We're good. Don't come in. So we're trying to work out how to unjam this thing. So we get looking at this thing. We can't work it out. And we're looking at the front and we get all the, all the papers from the feed tray and we put on top, careful, keep them in order. And as we're thinking, working out how to open it, we press the button and the whole lid just sprung up like a jack-in-the-box and everything went down the back of the machine onto the floor and spilled out under the machine around our feet. Everyone's notes mixed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as we both looked at one another going, this is not good. Good. <laughs> so we're then on our hands and knees trying to play snap with... I've got an SS1, page six, what have you got? I've got an SS, does that look like the same writing? That looks like the same. <laughs> so we put them all back together, eventually got them together and we give them back and we said, right, we're good to go. Anytime during the rally, we had the team radio, anytime during the rally, anytime we heard possum come over the team radio, there's only possum notes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, possum to, to um, management, we'd stopped, uh-oh. And he'd call something and we'd go... <laughs> it's not us. Not it's, us. Not the, it's, it's not the notes. <laughs> As I said, I had to wait for a couple of people to die to tell that story. Tell a story. Oh. Well, we did get him back in the right order, but yeah, only, only co-drivers and rally people understand that. There was... and, and, and is the moral to the story here? I did, was that a breakthrough win for Colin that weekend too, I think, wasn't it? It so, was, and mm. it was a big party. Mm. And I've got to tell you, I thought he was fast despite his notes, not because of his notes. Gotcha. But when he was on a high, he was just on a high, you mm. know, and he, mm. his notes were nowhere near as comprehensive as, say, mm. um, as, say, possums. Mm. 
and um, so he was on a high. Ari, Ari went out of the rally. He broke an engine in the famous Motu stage, and we were actually got through the, the 45 kilometres and 900 corners of Motu, taking a bit of a break. And it's very early, we've left there very early in the morning, and we get a call, uh, Ari Vartan and to gravel crew, and we're going, oh, that's us. So we, uh, yes, uh, gravel crew to Ari, uh, yes, please. What is the temperature at the end of Motu? Uh, it's cold. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he says, uh, no, what is the exact temperature, please? And we go, ah, oh, uh, give us one minute. <laughs> so we parked outside the school, the local kinder school, so we have to go into the school to see if they've got a thermometer. thermometer. <laughs> the school teacher introduces us to the children who all have to say good morning and we have to say good morning back and then they have to ask the question, what is the temperature if we find out it's like three degrees after we say oh, thank yous and goodbyes and they say, say, they say thank you to the rally drivers visiting us. <laughs> and we have to get back on the radio and tell, tell Ari that it's three degrees at the end of Motu. Excellent. The connection with Derek helps with Dean, I think, going to the UK and so on. What I wanted to ask about Dean's driving and stuff, did you sort of help guide him in, in a driving sense? Or was it more on the mental side? Because you've been so strong on, on that and learnt that from a, a young Yeah, fellow, no, you? I don't think I've ever given Dean a driving lesson. Hmm. You either can or you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And Dean wasn't a real out there kid. I mean, hmm. his sister was more outgoing than Natasha. him. Natasha. Yeah, 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 Natasha. She mm -hmm. was more ballsy, I suppose you'd say. Mm -hmm. It was an absolute shock that he drove cars as fast as he did. I was just a... I mean, I wanted him to be involved in rallying. Mm. He was more into touring car racing than mm. rallying, and, mm. but his dad was the Australian rally champion. So mm. he started to rally, uh, drive a, a car when he could. But no, he got a chance because he showed some potential in the Hyundai. He got a chance because uh, Derek Ringer was managing the, um, the two litre rally championship in England. England. Yep. And he got a chance to test and he tested in a go-kart over there and the people who were contracted to test him actually wrote a report that's saying that if, if indeed what he says is true, he's never raced a go-kart, it has to be said that his performance was extraordinary. Excellent. And he actually, I think he broke their, their, their lap record that, of what carts they used to mm -hmm. this test. Mm -hmm. So he got a test for the factory. But by the time we did two rallies and thought, well, this will help him into the test, they disbanded the motorsport team. Mm. So, but it was more about it was more about the psychology of winning, mm. and um, because it's hard to give them driving lessons, isn't it? Mm. I mean, but what sort of things would you have said in a, in a psychology sense? I don't know. Mm. I don't really remember. Mm. I, I grew up the son. I grew up the son of a farmer, mm. and we everything was about football. Mm. He grew up the son of the Australian rally champion, mm. so everything we did was about motorsport. So we were speaking just you know before we started this interview. Dean and I were speaking about what had, things that had happened over the weekend, mm. and quite often we speak about well because we go rallying together, we run the team together, and we, his comment was and my comment is just, people just don't get it. They just don't get how things work. Mm. You know, you, so people are living dying by the tenth of a second per kilometre, but the first thing you got to do in a rally is actually finish the rally. Mm. In the early days, everybody finished the rally and those on zero points had a special stage to decide, decide the winner. Mm. But now it all seems to be about the special stage. Mm. But it's not all about the special stage. It's about, let's keep our nose clean for the entire rally mm. first, but the, now the stages will decide the fine points of the winner. Mm. So we had people like Harry Bates that had major stuff up Mm. on the first day. If that was clay target shooting, that wouldn't be him done. Mm. Absolutely but he came done. back. Mm. Mm. He come back because you can drive brilliantly. Mm. You miss a target and clay target shooting. It's <coughs> all over. It's mm. all over. It doesn't mm. matter if you shoot the next 150 or 200 straight, it's still all over. Mm. So he kept his nose clean for the rest of the rally. We had some of our drivers making mistakes. We had Scott Petter hitting a rock. You know, mm. We had all of this stuff happening. So it wasn't the, it wasn't the tenth of a second a kilometre that won that rally on the weekend. And we had the young drivers come up saying, oh, was it within two tenths of a second a kilometre of so-and-so on, mm. on this stage? But the next stage, you're parked in, in the bush. So maybe you're going a bit too fast. Let's, mm. Can we get through the whole rally cleanly? Can we do one corner at a time cleanly? Don't even look at the time set. At different times I say to Dean, do not look at the time. Really? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Because what's the point? What's the point? You know that you've just got to do your best job. Mm. Do every corner properly and the time will come to come you. To you. Mm. Yeah, there's no point, um, no point worrying who's got what. You know, maybe we get down to the last stage and mm. we're two seconds or three or four seconds in it, 
then we might have to throw a bit of caution to the wind. Mm. There's a couple of things I want to get through as we head into the, the final portion of this, of this conversation. Firstly, you have driven some other things. The, the rally has become a, a significant thing. In terms of on land, we'll get to uh, water in a minute, but on, on land, you've driven a sprint car, uh, the yeah. Kendricks, the Kendrick sprint car? 700 or 800 horsepower. Did you do the Claremont before it yeah, closed? Claremont, too, I think, yeah, Claremont, the big it? track that went fast. That <clears throat> I had an opportunity to drive one, it was a sponsor's day, they were, had a few media people there. Mm. And um, I got a chance through a media contact, uh, Lynn Matthews, who did media for both of us. Yep. And um, they plonked me in the car, and I, I think Jeff Kendrick might have been reluctant, but mm -hmm. uh, he put me in. And uh, all of a sudden, as they're explaining the, the dog lever and the oil pressure and this, I get a big bump in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. Push as, car, you're off. The, I'm <laughs> off. And it's jiggering out onto the track. It all seems funny and it drives like a truck and it's got a big Herman Munster accelerator pedal that doesn't even have a heel on the floor. And then you hit the switch and bop! It went from zero horsepower to about 800. And it wants to turn right into the wall if you don't give a throttle, basically, you doesn't it? You picked up on that, have you? <laughs> so I guess I had one chance at this. And I thought, I needed to drive it for five laps, sit down, think about it, have a talk and go out and have another go. But I realised mm. that wasn't going to happen. Mm. So I'm driving in amongst some of the journos who are just going to pop, 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 pop. And they're basically rolling the track for the, for the proper drivers. So I'd go and putt, 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 and I'd get to the straight and I'd give it a big boot full and then I'd give it a bit more around the corner eventually. I did a couple of laps and I started to get a bit of a hang of it and the, start of the foot started to stay down a bit harder and a bit longer and then I was realising the wind was catching the wing and I realised it wasn't going to turn right, but you had to stay on the gas. But my neck was starting to get a bit sore, I was starting to get a bit dizzy, I was looking at my TV screen, <laughs> i.e. the track, on a bit of an angle. <laughs> But I was still giving it what, and I thought if I stuff up, she's all over. But mm. this is me one chance. And after about five laps, I was going pretty hard. And then I got, and I've now heard the story later that Jeff Kendrick was giving an interview and he called his minion over and said, get that car off the track. <laughs> <laughs> and when they called me off the track, because he kept, kept, kept getting interrupted by this noise, all the other journos weren't going on pretty hard, but one car was. I came in and to stop alongside them, but the bloody thing wouldn't go out of gear. It's got a dog box, yes. a dog yeah. gear, yeah. just like a but ski you've got to boat. Knock it out off. Yeah, 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 yeah. And to get that out, you've got to have it unload. So I give it a bit of throttle unload, but it still, it's all I did was accelerate, and eventually I had to skid it to a stop in front of everybody, and they dragged me out by the collar. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a journalist came up and said. Jeff, do you realise that he did like 18.7 seconds <laughs> and the track record's, you know, and it was light and day. And, you know, yes, I, I, you know, you know, that last second is for, take forever to get. And he said, then they said, that's amazing, don't you think? And it's the first time he's driven, he says, he's the Australian rally champ. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, uh, and I, I didn't realise where the throttle stop was. No matter what you drive, whether it's a supercar or whether it's mm. your boat or whether it is, Sooner or later, your foot hits the throttle stop, yep. doesn't it? And you yep. go, this has got some power, or it doesn't have some, some power. power. Yep. On that thing, I didn't know where the throttle stop was because I didn't get to it. Wow. If I put my foot down, it just went. It yeah. just still went. Yeah. So, so much grunt. Yeah, very brave. Mm. Yeah, very brave. Driving. You've done some stuff at Wanneroo too, haven't you? There's been some circuit <laughs> racing at times. I think there's an RX-7 that springs to mind, among other things. Yeah, I've, I've gone circuit racing twice. My mate Steve, you know, my yes. partner. Uh, a good friend who still loans me his trailer, even with this rally, Stuart Dixon, uh, a 300 kilometre race, I'll be his partner. We're a similar build, perfect. Mm. He's a pretty good punter. I don't think I even get to practice or test or nothing, but I'm, st I'm the Australian rally champion, I've got to know. Anyway, I came in and he puts, he, I get in his car, the Escort, and Steve is so excited that as he put me in the seat, He's reached forward and pulled down on the lapels on the harnesses and wrenched them so tight that I couldn't breathe. <laughs> and then he's banged the roof so hard to say to go that it's almost deafening. Then he slammed the door. And in slamming the door, and I didn't realise this, the chrome strip has come off the door and it's gone up my glove. <gasps> so this is no big deal and you don't know this until you get to the first right-hand corner, which is at the end of the straight. So as I've... <laughs> gone under the straight and I've done a small right and a small left and I've got to, I wouldn't turn, I couldn't turn because it was jammed in the, it's jammed in here <laughs> and I couldn't even get my hand off the steering wheel <laughs> and I've just understeered off the edge of the track into the sand trap. 
I didn't bog it, mm. but I struggled to recover after from that. that. <laughs> and then the RX-7, I eventually got in the RX-7 and after about two or three laps, the exhaust fell off and I ran over it. I might have run over it in the next lap actually, but I thought, it doesn't matter, it just hasn't even had a muffler. But the exhaust was so loud, it was deafening me in this RX-7. <laughs> and I was a very relieved man when they black flagged me to come in. So <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's the extent of my circuit racing. I love it. Back to motorcycles, which you brought up before. There is a yarn on you, I think, trading a Honda for a Husqvarna. And you go to do a race. If I, I, might, I mightn't have the brand right here. But on the start line, was it like a scramble? <laughs> It goes backwards, it goes in reverse. Is this right? It is correct. No, I had a Honda. Yeah, I had a Honda trail bike. It's my, I bought it when my father was alive. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it was a new bike, it was, it was a beautiful bike. But then I got caught up in motocross and, it was gonna, and I've crashed it. And I've, during the week, I've taken it to Perth and I've sold it. And I used the proceeds to buy a, a fairly old Husqvarna 360. And I'm at the Northern Motocross track. And eventually I'll become president of the club and eventually I race all around the state and I've got a sponsor who's still a mate and I get to A grade. I don't win any major events, but I do okay. But on this start line, there's 72 riders on the start line. I'm in the middle of it. And I think, I can't remember if it was a hand on head start or a clutch start, but there's so much cacophony and smoke and noise, you just can't hear yourself think. And it's the main feature and it's everyone is qualified and I'm in the middle of it. And my bike is nearly stalled, but I haven't, hasn't stalled, but I've picked up the throttle. And as I'm blipping, I'm thinking, it sounds a bit different, but there's so much noise and it's, you know, they're about to start and it's just mayhem. Anyway, as I've dropped the clutch on the start, 71 bikes have surged forward and one bike has gone backwards. <laughs> and the rider is me. And I've got as much of a surprise as everyone around me. And of course, every being in my body is expecting this to go forward. forward yeah. And it's gone backwards. So I've actually got my weight forward and everything's because the bike's going. And as it went backwards, it just went back and the, the handlebars hit me in the guts and my nose went over the front and my nose is running on the front knobbly tyre and it's still running at like 100 miles an hour backwards, <laughs> waiting to fall over as everyone racing forwards trying to miss it. And when I tell that story, people go, that cannot be true, but I can tell you for a fan, people have had it happen. The two straight will run backwards, no problem at all. Oh the God. piston doesn't know which way it's going. I mean, it just goes up and down. Mm. So. <laughs> Crazy. From a boating point of view, is it the last offshore race win or maybe even offshore title win? I can't remember. What, yeah. what, what happened there? Tell us about the boats. They must have been awesome, weren't they? Oh, well, I raced inshore power boats. I mm -hmm. raced um, offshore power boats. I won an Australian Unlimited inshore title with a, with a, a tunnel racing boat. A mate Crazy. of mine had a tunnel boat that did over 100 miles an hour, but he flipped it and got the nerves up. And 160. Oof. Yeah. yeah, and this is down around, we used to have a very big race down around in Mandra for a big carnival, mm -hmm. and raced it, where they still race boats at Harrison Island. Mm -hmm. And this is probably why I went rallying, because I would come down with this special race boat, and I'd come down to, for the race meeting, and I thought they were, I shouldn't say this because my mates still race, but mm -hmm. I thought they were prima donnas a bit. Mm -hmm. But they were probably being cautious, but they would cancel the race meeting because it had rained too much in the country and there was too much shit coming down the river. And they didn't want to hit a log or didn't want to hit a mm. twig or something. Mm. And so we'd be at, we're ready to race and they cancel the racing. And I'm going, this is bloody not on. So I bought a rally car because my thoughts were, well, they rally all weather, it doesn't matter. Mm. But in the middle of all that, I ended up, I won the last uh, 100 mile ski race in the ocean um, outright. We bought, we bought a boat with a, with a, with a mate called um, Terry Hartley. We shared the boat and it was a 17 foot Donzi with a 200 horsepower Black Max on it. Did about 80 miles an hour inshore or offshore. Mm. And we did, we raced it offshore. Uh, I won the last offshore powerboat race ever held in WA in 1983. Mm -hmm. It was about 100 miles. Did a round of the Australian titles. The Australian championship was held in WA in the early 80s, seven boats came from Victoria with a couple of big cigarette hulls in the middle of all that. And the Victorian boats came one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I came eighth. First West Australian boat, but I had a bit of a plan, it didn't work out that well. But the big cigarette hulls with the big, you know, the huge ends, the type of things that still race, they did about 80 miles an hour at the time, do more than that now. And my, did 80 miles, my boat did 80 miles an hour, I'll just sit in their wake. So we got a race from Bustleton to Ganship, 200 mm -hmm. miles. I'd never been from Bustle the Antship. All I knew was keep the coast on the right. That was it. Miss the reefs, keep the coast on the right. 
had to stop in Mandra for some fuel. I mean, roughly Mandra was in there somewhere. Mm. So off we went. We came around about 40 boats in a big line as they do and the big flag dropped and there's 39 in the line and there's me tucked up the arse of one of these big cigarette holes <laughs> and we're doing about 30 miles an hour. And as they said go and the big flag went down, they've just, the throttle man has just put the throttles down, not the map man, because there's three of them in it, mm. not the bloke with the maps, not the bloke with the steering wheel, but the throttle man has just gone off like that and about 20 tonnes of water just went into air straight into my face and just about sunk the boat in one go. <laughs> by, the time, by the time I extricated myself from that and the boat nearly stopped dead full of water, they were just a mere speck on the horizon and I scrambled to get the rest of the water out of the boat and keep going. So we eventually wow. made up some time, but wow. it wasn't such a good plan. There's a couple of other things to, to chat with you about here. Um, the boys tell me, I think it might have been Crispy, I can't remember, one of the, the boys in the team, to ask you about State Bank Trial, the Mahindra Rally Car. Um, t I mean, tell us about that event. It sounds, it sounds gruelling. Was it 110 starters and you finished fourth? In that yeah. Thing? yeah. It was 110 starters and I was asked by Peter Crute, who was the owner of Perth Shock Absorbers, if I'd like to drive it. I was showing some potential. Mm. He wanted someone with some grit and determination. They hadn't done so well in the Australasian Safari the year before, so here we go. And I took the car, this, it was basically a, a Willys Jeep with a Crossflow Falcon engine in it. Mm. It was a piece of rubbish really, but it did 100 miles an hour, handled badly, stopped worse. Anyway, I had it in Northern. Do we want a bigger fuel tank? No, we don't. We're good. It does this, it does this economy. It will this, this. Do we want any spare brake pads? No, we don't. We'll be right. Anyway, off we went. We were seated maybe 10th, and I don't think anyone was all that happy we were seated 10th because there's some proper machines and we've got this pretty rough looking Jeep. But after the prologue, we were actually fourth. So they had to sort of stop their moaning about that. And even though I'm not sure we finished fourth or fifth, maybe, maybe it was fourth, mm -hmm. but we were the last car that did the entire course. I think it could have been fifth we finished. If you were slower than us, you couldn't do the course. Mm -hmm. We had to do about, um, oh, maybe it was 10,000 kilometres in seven days and the, some, of the, some of the legs were 1,400 kilometres long and I had, in seven days, I had 10 hours sleep and only, oh. and only four hours was in the bed. The rest of it was propped up against the window. We shared a service crew with Jerry McGrody. He bombed out the first night. The service crew went home with our clothes, our spares. Oh. They've actually left the spares and the clothes with other people and it was only through the next five or six days we found bits and pieces of our spares and clothing with other crew. But there was a lot of funny stories and that'll certainly be a few chapters in the book. Book, for sure. <clears throat> One of them was uh, at a, a tank. It was so hot and uh, it was such a long stage and we're stuck in someone's dust and we keep going on this this uh, like a station track and we go and pass some water tanks and I go it's pretty hot I'm going to stop at this next tank and there's any water I'm able to swim and we're in a competitive stage and the co-driver Peter has gone Rob that'll take too much time I said Peter it's not going to matter it's so dusty we can't get we can't catch the car in front of us and the bloke behind us can't catch us and if we will see him coming so the next tank I pull up I jump up the side of the tank it's got water in it so I'm in and in two seconds flat, I peel my clothes off except me jocks. He thinks, stuff it, if he's in, I'm in. So he peels his clothes off, he's in, and we're splashing around in the tank in our jocks. And then we look over the side of the tank, like, um, like Freddy, you know. <laughs> and we Peering go, Dad, the there's side. a car coming. <laughs> so we pile out of the tank, and we go, Dad, there's a car coming. And we couldn't, because we're wet, we couldn't get our clothes on. So we stuff it. We put our helmet on, our boots on, and we jumped in the car. In your jocks? In our jocks. <laughs> And we took off and we managed to hold our position and about 150 kilometres later, we've engrossed in the whole rally, safety first, helmet, boots, jocks, harnesses, and we arrived at the control, did it for a reasonable time, and the control officials looked in, <laughs> seen us rallying in our jocks and said, it's been pretty hot, mate. <laughs> so just one of the many stories, but... For about three or four days, all I wanted to do was get to Alice Springs and fly home. It was just, I was exhausted. I've had a go it, for it wasn't me. Was, <laughs> and he's irrepressible, irrepressible mm. to the point it would kill us. Mm. And he said, Rob, I thought you had more, more grit than that. I said, well, you were wrong. And, he, and I said, all I was just to Alice Springs and we're going home. Well, when I got to Alice Springs, I had four hours sleep in the bed. Not a bed he organised, just a spare bed someone had. And um, he convinced me to keep going. 
And from then on, my, my mind changed. It went from, I don't want to continue to, doesn't matter what happens, I am going to finish. And circumstance and life threw way more at us in the second half than the first half, but the, the attitude had changed. Mm. So yeah, it was, a, it was a real ordeal. I must listen, if you haven't already, is the Rusty's Garage episode with Hall of Fame and Eel Bates. But it's not just for Ali fans, from a love of long distance truck driving in the team transporter, to the title winning cars he's kept and driving at Bathurst. I'm thinking, geez, what do I do here? So then I hop in the car, Dowson straps me in, he gets in the door, I don't care what they my lads swear on you. Of course you are, of course you are. I don't care what they fucking told you. You just get out there and hold this thing flat. So he knew they were... So he knew, as I say, he'd raced all over the world. Mm. He was a professional. Neil also talks about the emergence of his sons, Harry and Lewis, as next-gen ARC success stories and the incredible partnership he shared with co-driver Coral Taylor. Now back to Neil's rival in the early 90s, Rob Harridge. Safaris. (laughs) Can we talk about that? What in, you know, uh, the latter stages of your, of your driving life, if you like, attracted you to that. You and Dean both tackle it. You have a Forester and an XV, and both have gone through quite a transformation yep. for that. And what you do with those vehicles has really turned some heads against yeah, the quality of the field, hasn't it? So. Absolutely. Um, when my gravel rallying finished, I, you know, I had the last of the crashes and I've gone near the Did you make to... a conscious choice there? Did you go, that's it, or, or what did you do? No, I made a, a subconscious choice. I mm. mean, we, some of our business started to go towards tarmac rallies and I did the first 10 or so Targa West and I did the Targa Tasmania to no great effect. It's in the top 10 initially, but then made a mistake. Mm-hmm. Finished, but not well. And, um, but my wife, Debbie, was concerned about the tarmac. Mm-hmm. She says, the gravel, yes. But she did some wrecking with me in Target Tassie and, and up out of Perth and she going, no, the speeds are too high and mm-hmm. you know, the, the risks are too big. You know, she's not keen on that. Okay. So and I've gone, well, I've got nothing left. I've won two Australian Rally Championships. I've won five West Australian Championships. That was more than anyone else. One more than Ross Duncan. And, so that was important <laughs> to me. <laughs> and, I bet um, there's some good combos on the boat about that yeah, sometimes. And, yeah, yeah. Um, so... I then got interested in the safari and of course this is leading on from the state bank trial when, you know, sadly Peter Cruz has passed away, Mm -hmm. but when he said, I don't think you're made of the right stuff, I thought you're made of the right stuff and I said, well, you're wrong, but he wasn't wrong, it's just that I didn't prepare the car Uh and the car wasn't well prepared and and I thought, I've always thought I wanted to come back and have another go. So when the Australasian safari was in, in Perth or running out of Perth, uh, my mate Justin Hunt was running it. A friend of mine was doing a control and he convinced me to go out and do a control with him for the seven days. And mates of mine win the rally. We did control every day and at night time we camped and then the next day we moved on to another control. And I enjoyed the time out, but I wasn't big on the camping. And I thought if I don't compete, he'll ask me out again. So I better, better build a car. So I came back and I said to Dean and Steve, Steve was still alive, I said, I'd like to do the safari. And I go, oh, yeah, I thought you might. And um, I said, but I need, I think I said, I need $60,000 to do it. And they go, oh, really? I said, well, we need to buy Pajero, and we need 20000 to repair it, and we need 20000 to run it. And Dean quite correctly said, Dad... What are we doing a Pajero yeah, for? Yeah, well, what are we doing a Pajero for? Mm. Mm. He said, it's, it's, it's got to be a Subaru. And he said, and if, we, if a Subaru can't do it, we don't have any business being in a rally. And that was probably fair comment, you know. Mm-hmm. I was just gonna try and take the easy path. Mm. I go, okay, well, we need more, I need $80,000 then. So we bought a $30,000 um, off the showroom. They wanted to sell me an extended service contract <laughs> and, and paint protection. <laughs> I said, Prob- probably won't be needing that. <laughs> And um, so I built it, and of course, when we rolled up on rally tyres and with you know a bit of, as you can see in the, in the behind us, it's got a, a stainless steel wire from the front to the windscreen to try and flick branches over the top. Um, Quinny flicked that bit of wire and said, that won't last five minutes. Well, it's still on 10 years later. 
And everybody just laughed and poo-pooed and said, the forester will not do it. He can't do it. it won't, it's not strong enough. It's not big enough. And I said, it will do it because it does it now. The bloke that sets the, sets the course is in a forester. So don't tell me we won't do it. It just might we won't do it like you wanted to do it. Mm. So we, we built the car and we built, put too much in it. We carried too many spares. And of course, if you carry too many spares, you need the spares because the car's too heavy and now you need the shit you're carrying. Mm. So now we don't carry nothing. And you know what? If, the less we carry, the less chance we need, the less we've carried. So it's a bit of a self, self um, mm. serving type uh, ideal that I've got. But anyway, we, uh, we were certainly outclassed and outgunned the first year. And we learned some things though. We learned we needed bigger tyres. The rally tyres were too small. They wouldn't roll over things. They hit things too hard. They put too much load into the car. So we then started to massage things and got bigger tyres and rolled over things. And we went from struggling to even finish the first event to the second year coming second outright. And one of the persons uh, who still competes, his family still competes, says, oh, it's I said, how did you like the event, Reg? And he goes, oh, it was all right, except that bloody forest that comes second, so it was shit. <laughs> and they said, well, why didn't you come second? Oh, well, I, I could have, but I broke the car because I did this. And they said, well, they didn't. Mm. And they said, what do you do, Reg? And Reg says, well, I build roof trusses. And they said, well, Maximum Motorsport build rally cars. cars yeah. And so all, we, all we've done really from then is massage a few things and put in a stronger six-speed gearbox. And that's taken us from a production class mm -hmm. to the outright class. And the outright class means against the big V8 mm. off-road things and the Dakar cars, many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it was, and the Australian Safari was a tough event. There was, mm. the problem was we were probably the fastest, but when it was rough and tough, we were the slowest. And if we were faster than them, we were 5% faster. But when it was really rough going, they were 100% faster than us. Mm. If we were doing 20 kilometres an hour, they were doing 40. But when it was suiting us, we were doing 160, they were doing 150. So we needed the event to come to us a bit. Mm -hmm. So we needed to improve and the event came to us a little bit. They, you know, they realised that <coughs> if, the other problem was if it was rough and tough, that the big hero trucks would get in front of us and then when it suited us, we couldn't get back past them. Mm. Mm. We couldn't make enough impression to get back past them. Mm. So we, uh, we came second and fourth outright in the, um, the two, two of the four safaris, so we're pretty happy with that. And in the sun, first Sunraiser we did, we led that with one day to go and broke the engine. So it's only long distance event I've never finished and we were leading by eight minutes. So mm. that's a bit of a stick in my throat. You, you've done some incredible things across the course of your career. Is there, is there an event either locally, internationally that you would have loved to have done that you haven't done? Is there sort of, I mean, I struggle to look at it and think that there's unfinished business because you've done so much. Well, I had someone come up and say good day yesterday, and his name is Chris Hayring, and we ran his son Toby in rallies. Mm -hmm. And Chris Hayring is quite famous in WA because he sold his business, Kinetic Suspension, to Toyota for the delinking of sway bars, mm -hmm. and he sold it for about $55 million to, to Munro Wiley, I think, and then sold the idea to Nissan and Toyota. And his, his system was in the Citroens when they were banned from the World Rally Cars. Mm. And he said, Rob, when are you going to do Dakar? And sadly, my wife was in the earshot and said, he's not doing Dakar. <laughs> and he said, well, when you do Dakar, let me know, because I'd, I'd love to. He said, Toby and I went to Dakar at the invitation of Nissan when I was doing deals with Nissan. Mm -hmm. And he said, it was just staggering and mind blowing. And he said, I'd love to come along with you. And we have thought about that. But in the early days, when we were building these cars for the safari, and we're trying to build it for the rules. Mm. And what, what rules do you build it for? Mm. And there's some interpretation in rules, and rules are for fools to follow and wise men to interpret the, li interpret the limits of. But I think at one point they wouldn't allow turbocharged petrol cars in it, and that was us. That was the turbocharged mm. petrol. They had turbocharged mm. diesels and they had big natural aspirator petrols. Mm. So you know, that's why some of them have got a turbo diesel five-cylinder mm. BMW, and some have got big American V8s in them. Even if they're buggies and sophisticated somethings, they've got big yank V8s mm. in them. Mm. But I did notice that they've, they've got V8 petrols now, so. But I'm 70. Uh, just turned. Just turned 70. Just turned. But a fairly healthy 70. Mm. Never smoked. Drunk very little. Mm. Oh, in latter years, mm. in early years. My sister probably said I probably made up for a few years there. <laughs> um, 
It's a pretty big call, though. Mm. Um, and to what to what effect? Mm. I, I think the terrain would be too too tough for our cars. Mm -hmm. You know, our cars are pretty effective and they're pretty good on the sheep stations. Mm. They're pretty good on the Australian conditions. Are they suitable for South American deserts and yep. flash floods and Middle East and Middle East, whatever, East yeah. deserts mm -hmm. and big rocks? Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Maybe not. I don't think we've got the budget. We haven't got... We certainly don't have the budget for that. Mm. So, have I got unfinished business? Uh, not sure. Okay. That's a good question, actually. Okay. Someone actually asked me years ago, when I'd won one of the Australian Championships and I had maximum motorsport, some school kid came up and asked if he could interview me. And why he chose me, but they probably their thing had to interview someone. Mm -hmm. And he asked me a question which I've never been able to answer correctly. It was the best question I've ever heard asked. He said, at what point of your career did you realise you were successful? And I've gone, that's a good point. Mm. To some people, I've never been successful because I haven't won a world championship. To other people, I've been wildly it's successful. Australian championships and things, that, that's a huge achievement. Huge achievement. Well, uh, of course, but it, it got me thinking, at what point in your life, mm. The, the things that drive you, at what mm. point in your life do you decide that you've been successful? We're surrounded by an amazing business. You've got some incredible grandkids. You've won Australian titles on the water <laughs> in rally cars. Um, yeah. You're healthy and well. I mean, I think that is the definition of success. Yeah, well, it? I did get emotional at my 70th birthday. Recently, I didn't want a birthday party because I'm not mm. big on them, but uh, most of the grandkids were there, but not all. But mm. I looked at my family and I thought, that's probably the answer. Mm. The answer is the family. Family. Um, mm. But that's not why we're here. That's not why mm. we're here. We're here to talk about the motorsport. Mm. No, I think Dakar is a step too far. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm pleased that Dean is doing the safari because I thought he'd like it. I don't mm. know whether he would have been into the Australasian safari. That I think he could have got his white suit dirty. <laughs> so, <laughs> or his hair. He's got beautiful might, hair. Might he's always got beautiful hair. hair. <laughs> well, Dean's got the hair for TV, not like his dad. It's, for the people that don't have the vision, his dad's pretty bald and Dean's got a good head of hair. Yeah. And he's got the face for TV and I've got the face for radio. <laughs> so, But the Sunrise safari is a bit softer. It's mm. not the rough, tough, tough mining mm. outback at sheep stations. We're racing, as the director, Troy Bennett says, we're racing on sheep stations, not for sheep stations. Yeah. But I can tell you we are racing for sheep, sheep stations, stations yeah. because any time they're timing us or they say go, we're racing for sheep stations. Mm. I rounded someone up in that safari that I came second and I was trying to pass him and he wouldn't let me pass. And this didn't have push to pass then. It was just calling on radio. And I had to fudge where I was and... Eventually, I got past him, and at the end of the stage, it was like 180 kilometres long. He came and said, "Rob, why? What was the hurry? What was the rush? Like it's a seven-day event." I said, "Reg, it's a rally. <laughs> They're timing us. Just move over or Sorry. get out of the way." You know, yeah. maybe back to the first time I'm on the first, the first stage. I drive like an old nana on the road, so it's not, it's not a speed thing. It's a competition it's thing. thing. And mm. to win rallies, you've got to drive faster than I'd like to drive. Mm. And I think Dean's the same. I don't like driving that fast, but you don't win shit driving slow. Mm. So it's a that, competition. That, that kind of leads me because of your love of engineering and what you've done to the cars. Do you get an attachment to say the the legacy behind us, or is it just the tool that helped you do that to to succeed no, no, the competition? No, I, I get an attachment when you know when I my first marriage to Dean's and Natasha's mother broke up, and I you know I got together with Debbie, my current mm. wife, you know. And we have a great relationship, but we had no money and uh, we're going back. We've been together, you know, 25 or so years. And at one point I sold that legacy because we had no money, we had no house, we were renting, we had no way to raise a deposit. Maximum Motorsport wasn't necessarily doing well, then we only just started. Mm -hmm. So the life was in turmoil, so I sold the car. And I sold it to a friend of mine for $45,000, which was a bit of money then. Mm. And um, I came home and I told Debbie that I'd sold the car and she cried and said, um, you're not selling it. It means too much to you to sell it. And I said, but we need the money. We need the money for a house. Mm. And she said, we'll get the money one day, but you won't get the car back. So she said, give Ken his money back. It was a friend of mine. And I said, I've already spent 5,000. She said, just, I'm sure he'll be fine. So I went back to Ken and said, Ken, the deal's off. And by the way, I owe you 5,000 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and he was fine for that. but. 
No, she got attached to it and I got attached to it. And it sat on our back veranda. And any time she complained that, goodness sake, when are we going to move this car? Yeah. I'm going, well, you, you had the chance to get rid of it. <laughs> so, no, I'm pretty good at getting stuff. I'm not very good at letting stuff go, which is why we have a couple of triple stackers behind us and another one coming and building a man cave. And But they say he who dies with the most toys win. I don't know whether I'm winning, but... One of the toys is a caravan, which I think means you're going to hit the road and enjoy a bit of that. At 70, will you slow down? Realistically, are you going to retire and stop? Debbie hopes so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Right. And people say, people say to Dean, you want to be careful with your dad. You know, I've been talking about retiring for a year. Mm. People are sick of hearing it. Mm. I'm sick of saying it. And in the last year, you know, they put together a deal to build these cars for Subaru. And mm. I'm saying to Dean, this is a good idea. And Chris, I, can, I, can I interject here? <laughs> I think Crispy said that you were quoted in maybe in the lead up to the 70th, it was quite funny, where you basically said, I'll have to live to be 130 to finish all these fucking cars. <laughs> 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 is that right? <laughs> Something like oh, that. Something anyway. like that. Maybe that was him saying that. It was it okay? Uh, I said, I hope it, it's a good idea and I hope it floats. Yes. But who's going to build these fucking cars? <laughs> and he said, Dad, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. Well, guess what? We've got the problem. And, I've, and they're beautifully made. Right? They are they're beautifully, beautifully made. made. And I've got to tell you, for those that are listening, mm. the last one I've made, get in and buy that because it'll be the most valuable because the last one I'm making. Is it? It's too hard. Mm. Um, I say that, but if somebody said, why don't we build a special safari car, mm -hmm. that interests me. Mm. You know, we're cookie cuttering at the moment, but mm. the problem is even with cookie cutting the cars, I just agonise over every nut and every bolt mm. and every line and every curve. Because the craftsmanship, it's in you, it's the way yeah. you want to build and it. And I can't, it? and yeah. Crispy, my long suffering mate mm. who comes and mm. helps me every day for nothing, mm. he, he knows, I trust him to drill a hole, and I'd trust him to finish off a piece of metal, but I'll check it. Mm. Because, and Debbie, my wife, says, Dale, don't agonise, don't sweat the small stuff. And mm. I said, Dale, I do sweat the small stuff and I can't turn it off. Mm. So, mm. so I, I would be interested, I'm probably just as interested in building and coming up with the design criteria to build a car to say, be successful and definitely win. You know, we have to push ourselves pretty hard on the Sunraiser to be successful. Mm. And Dean has been amazingly successful. He's done it for two years and led both years and but for a ball and it wasn't a ball joint it was a, a taper of a ball joint last year mm. maybe not it would have won it last year it certainly could have come second mm. and certainly we punched well above our weight with the cars mm. but we pushed the cars pretty hard and it's testament to them that they hold up mm. but you know the idea of building a bespoke car to be suitable for something like the um something like Dakar interests me, mm. but we certainly don't have the budget for that. Mm. But to do it to, um, to be suitable for a homegrown event, yeah, that interests me. Mm. So, and they say, Dean, be careful your dad doesn't just drop dead like other people do when they retire. Mm. And, but Dean replies, my dad will not just go and sit on the beach with his feet no. up. No. He'd be travelling around Australia with his gun, you know, calling to every gun club, like, join the dots, trying to win their local championship, their state championship, <laughs> get in the Australian team and represent the Olympics. Mm. So I'm probably a couple of years too old to try and get in the Olympics, yes. but it's not, not short of trying to get in the Australian team, I can tell you. Good on you. Go and enjoy. Go and enjoy hitting the road. I have no doubt there'll be, quote, unquote, projects that you will work on um, from time to time. Congratulations on what you've done on terra firma in, in rally cars and the Australian titles. You've won the unbelievable stuff on the water. I've thoroughly enjoyed hearing that. And it's been great at age 70 to, to see you get to celebrate that with your family, with your grandkids, even young Olivia, who was with us at the weekends, doing some amazing things yes, around yes. social media for, for Maximum Motorsport. Um, well done on what you've achieved. And I hope that 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 young school kid that came up and spoke to you has, has made you realise, as you rightly say, that maybe the success which Maximum continues to enjoy, but the, the, perhaps the zenith of it is the, is the family, mate. Yes, well done. Well thank done. you. And thanks for the opportunity to sell part of my story and the, for the second part of the story and the third, fourth and fifth, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Excellent, mate.
Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series editor and producer is Thomas Dullard. Audio production by Link Kelly. If you've got a guest suggestion, get in touch with me via social media. The Garage, that's where a journey begins with a tank full of passion-fueled stories. Stories.